uh, things are a bit discombobulated today. Okay, um, so I wanted to uh, preface my uh, materials today, which will be of a rather variegated nature, uh, with a few comments. Um, the materials today actually cut across uh, uh, multiple lines of the dynamic modeling that we're going to be discussing. Really, they, they apply at some level to all of the types of dynamic modeling. Because indeed, they, uh, they focus on general features of dynamical systems, which can be characterized by, by agent-based modeling, system dynamics modeling, and discrete event simulation, and hybrids thereof. Uh, and uh, in a way, today's lecture reflects a little bit of tech debt that, that I owe in terms of understanding of state space. Um, uh, but it goes beyond that. Um, I wanted to specifically, with respect to ABM, talk about ABM-specific considerations when it comes to state space that are, are uh, more textured um, and, uh, and more nuanced uh, than what we, um, what we would need to say for typical smaller aggregate system dynamics models. Now, um, in so doing, though, uh, I'm going to be highlighting certain features of ABMs to wit, uh, their large dimensionality, uh, the presence of stochastics that will be important for, um, for other elements of understanding. And uh, when I first reintroduced ABMs and what was really the, the second ABM lecture, the first one having occurred in the opening days of class, um, I noted that when it comes to ABMs, although we don't articulate them with building blocks that are, are characterized by stocks and flows, um, and while they're characterized at a lower level um, than, than stocks and flows, we're not keeping track of the number of individuals who are, say, infected. We're actually keeping track for each specific individual, Joe, Mary, Sam, Sue whether each of them is infected. Um, although although the, the mode of description is, is lower level, the building blocks are, are, are different, more numerous and more varied than with aggregate system dynamics models. The stock and flow lens retains its currency, retains its power, uh, retains its insights. Um, but when applying it, we need to aggregate up from the level of particular agents this diversity of whether it be a hundred or a thousand or a hundred thousand or a billion agents within our simulations, we have to aggregate up to levels uh, where we might think about a, conceptually a, a stock of, for example, infectives that counts at any one time the number of infectives. And it abstracts over the issue about whether it's Sam and John who are infected and Mary and Sue who are not or vice versa. Uh, it's just two people infected. Um, and, and I noticed that in relation to this issue of, um, of understanding these models and, and all those basic principles that we, we hit so hard on within the system dynamics area, the fact that the stock's gonna be rising if the, infl the net inflow is greater than the net outflow, falling uh, if the net inflow is less than the net outflow, in stasis, the count is going to be in stasis if, if the net inflow equals the net outflow. All those carry over here as well. And so if we see the number of infectives as totaled up across the population and agent-based model rising, it tells us something. It, it tells us that people are getting infected faster than they're losing infection, whether it be through recovery or, or mortality or, or treatment. Um, uh, mediated recovery, et cetera. Uh, and that's a powerful lens. Um, and we can reason about it in, in other effects too, the presence of, of uh, for example, feedbacks, et cetera. And today we're gonna be applying that lens when it comes to state space, um, because we're not gonna be able to typically exhaustively examine the state space of an ancient based model. It's too darn large. Um, and in fact, we'll see that it grows combinatorially. It grows geometrically, or if you, if, if you want to say, uh, using a, a continuous approximation exponentially with the number of agents.
Um, but we can summarize it in kind of a, a summary projection of state space um, into, say, three dimensions, the number of susceptibles, the number of infectives, and the number of recoveries. Um, and it won't be a, it, any, any one triple of those numbers, a value for S, for I, and R, won't be a complete summary of the state. It's, again, abstracting if it's Sue and Mary who are infected, and John and Sam, or not, or vice versa. But um, it can lend an appreciation for the dynamics of that system, uh, despite its summary character. It's just, it's not a complete state space. A, a, being at a certain point in that SIR state space uh, does not uniquely characterize what's going to be coming up, even for a, for a deterministic such agent-based model, much less for a stochastic one, where we have the vagaries of chance atop that. So we're going to see this. And, and, it, and it brings home the you know, the fact that these models are stochastic in, in the vast majority of cases. Uh, they're of, uh, you know, huge dimensionality if you were to enumerate the state, but it's, it's fruitful to summarize it. And I want to hit those points further and bring them home with some visualizations. Um, and and uh, I provided to you two example models on the Moodle site, and I'll be supplementing that in the next day or two with some additional ones that illustrate these points additionally. Um, one of them is actually a version. You can find it there now under the example model section, newly inaugurated uh, and released today, uh, which basically is an ecological modeling example with lynxes and hares, um, but in an agent-based, articulated in an agent-based framework, uh, using an agent-based lens. And the lynxes chase the hares around, and uh, the lynxes end up in a bad way if they can't find the hares, and the hares end up in a bad way if they are found by lynxes. Um, and uh, we examine the dynamics associated with that, the count of lynxes and the count of hares over time. And you find that, at least with many settings, it will exhibit an unusual similarity to some of those cycles that you see uh, with other ecological models, include the very one that some of you, with which some of you are grappling, even as I speak. But beyond that, we're going to be, we're going to be taking this lecture in an interesting direction, and one that I hope will whet the appetite and indeed the imagination of some of those present um, by crossing what I've just articulated with the issue of empirical data. Uh, one of the features of empirical data is that it provides us an avenue to, um, to ground models. And there's really two big ways that um, material to which you've been exposed thus far um, provides you to ground models. One of them is data allows us to parameterize models. So it allows us to estimate values for parameters uh, within a model. So maybe we have some data from, you know, from some uh, randomized control trials conducted with vaccines where we found that, uh, that individuals who received a COVID-19 uh, vaccine, say with AstraZeneca or Johnson & Johnson or, or Moderna or Pfizer, um, with one particular one of them, that they were protected against symptomatic disease uh, to a 95% level if you started looking at the period two weeks after they received their final dose. Um, well, uh, that might go into a, a model parameter associated with the effectiveness of, of, of that vaccine um, that, would be, uh, that would be used in a model to characterize um, you know, the amount of disease we'd expect after vaccination. And maybe we do the same thing for, for their chance of infection. And uh, we'd put that in there, and, and that would help us understand how much it might expect, be expected to reduce the probability someone gets infected. And all that is valuable. Uh, but there's, there's another major way that I, to which I exposed you to calibration. And I, I want to comment on this in part because I got a really good question last time during office hours, and like all office hours, it went unrecorded, my answer to it. 
but the students seem to find it helpful. So I'm going to pass it on to you. I've, I've asked you to review um, two lectures uh, that at a certain level seem to offer uh, a lot of commonalities. Um, one of them was on sensitivity analysis, whereby we, we varied our assumptions about parameter values um, systematically over some ranges. And we examined the model dynamics that was so induced, for example, how much certain key outcomes changed as we did so. Uh, sensitivity analysis affords us a sense of to what assumptions is a model most beholden? To what assumptions is a model uh, most sensitive, most, you could think of it as um, most, most um, fragile, right? You know, it's what degree do certain assumptions swing it in huge ways, whereas others very little, which is a hallmark of nonlinearity that that may exactly be the case. In fact, in different regions of state space, you may have different levels of sensitivity exhibited with respect to the same parameter, throwing that tidbit out to those who would like to chew on it. And, and this is great. Sensitivity analysis can clue us in to, to which parameters um, the model's most sensitive. And, and those parameters often become data collection priorities. They, they become priorities for closer measurement, for really putting the effort in to pin down a value for it, maybe conducting studies um, to, to measure that value, whether they be randomized control trials or you know, studies like we run with mobile phones, um, measuring contact patterns or measuring people's protective behavior, et cetera. And, and, and so it allows us to put our efforts into the, into the evidence that matters because some evidence may be considered by the model, but it's small potatoes in terms of its impact on the things we care about, whereas the other ones have disproportionate impact. And uh, so sensitivity analysis is very, very uh, valuable here. And I and want to remind you, it consists of systematically varying for different parameters, assumptions about those parameters, and seeing how it changes models, model output um, and learning from that. But there's another process to which I asked you to be exposed via a, um, via a video. Um, which at the face of it seems to have a lot of overlap and it's calibration. In calibration, we vary our assumptions about certain parameters. With calibration, we're interested in so doing because we're interested in understanding how model output varies as we change those parameters. So at a certain level, this sounds a lot like sensitivity analysis. And you could be excused for thinking that the two are close cousins. Um, and, and to a degree, they are. Um, maybe close cousins, you know, twice removed or something. Um, twice half cousins or something like that. Um, so how is calibration any different from sensitivity analysis? Oh, it's really different. In calibration, we're trying to match up the model output as best we can against empirical data. And we're trying to use the goodness of fit of that model against empirical data to, to tell us what values of those parameters are most likely to obtain, most likely to apply. Um, we want the model to match as closely as possible what we observe in the world, perhaps with respect to different model outputs. And and we're, we're kind of interested in the calibration process telling us, okay, that needs us to make these sort of assumptions about these parameters. Sometimes it's unique. It's, it points to one interpretation being clear. And other times, other times, ladies and gentlemen, it just points us to, you know, ranges of parameter values or, or, or you know, A uh, can be high and B low or B can be high and A low, but they can't both be low and they can't both be high. That tells us still something. It, it shapes our interpretation of what could be the case, the, the possibilities for things in the world. Um, and again, can prioritize data collection. Now, 
in this regard, calibration does something that parameterization cannot. Parameterization requires us to take data about a world about that can be boiled down to one particular assumption in, in, in the model. And so we conduct elaborate randomized control trials that cost tens of millions of dollars to arrive at that estimate of the effectiveness of the vaccine when judged from two weeks onward from the last dose as against infection or as against severe disease or what have you. And, and so we need data of a very particular sort to inform our parameter. It needs to be about exactly that parameter. And we can do a little bit of squirming around and, you know, maybe it's about two things and we have three different lines of data and we can determine the two possible values that come out of those collectively. But broadly speaking, it requires data that's very specific. By contrast, calibration, you know, often data about the world cannot be reduced to one parameter. I mean, if we look at the number of COVID cases over time in Saskatchewan or the number of COVID hospitalizations or COVID deaths or what have you, um, that's not gonna, I can't take that data, take it to the bank and say, tell me the right value for this parameter in isolation. And it's, it's not just about contact rate. Is it about contact rate? Yeah, it's about contact rate. It's affected by contact rate. But it's also about, you know, people's wearing masks, right? Um, it's it's not about whether they're nearby each other. It's about wearing whether they're wearing masks. It's it's moreover something about how quickly they're being detected by the care system. How many drive-through testing sites are available, and what are the criteria for getting tested? Can asymptomatic people even be tested? For a long time, they couldn't, despite, ladies and gentlemen, my protestations. Um, so there's a lot of data about the world that that can't be boiled down to one parameter. We can't we can't you know suck it in, transform it into an assumption about one parameter. Um, instead, it's it's emergent behavior of a system, and it involves lots of parameters that affect it. And to make use of that, we need to compare it against emergent behavior from our model. After all, these models are simplified representation of the world and, and we build it to understand emergent behavior. So we, we take data from the world and we compare it against comparable emergent, you know, sort of um, data for the same sort of thing from our model that's emergent. And we, in calibration, we alter our assumptions about the parameters so that they best align. And particularly, we alter our assumptions about parameters where we don't have great understanding. We don't have really good, good estimates for them, good values that, that we are about which we are confident. And calibration involves taking data from the world, systematically lining it up with data from the model, and having some sort of discrepancy function, some sort of goodness of fit to flip it around, objective function um, that, that tells us you know, how good a match our model results to what we see from the world. And then we adjust model parameters to best match the two. And that's, ladies and gentlemen, those are the parts that are, that are you know, significant parts of that are missing on sensitivity analysis. So sensitive analysis, we're modifying parameter values and we're seeing the model changes in, in output. That's great, but there's no, encounter with empirical data. There's no judgment about how good and effective it is. There's no honing in, homing in on, on particular assumptions about parameter values. That's absent during sensitive analysis. During sensitive analysis, we're trying to alter our assumptions about parameters such that the model results match as closely as possible what we see in the world. That's our quarry. That's our goal. Um, uh, did I? Okay, I, I may have just uh, uh, misstated a phrase in there. That's what we do during calibration. We try to get the model to match as closely what we see in the world by altering parameter values. Sensitivity analysis, we're just altering our assumptions and seeing how the model results change, but we're not actually judging it against things from the world. We're just seeing how those results change.
and that's useful. It informs our sense of sensitivity. Now, the two hang together. So if you have a sense from sensitivity analysis that certain parameters, that the model is very sensitive to certain parameters and you don't know good values, you don't, you're not confident about values for those parameters. Those are excellent parameters to calibrate, to try to pin down values in them from the emergent data we do have throughout the world. And it needn't be time series. It could be disconnected factoids. For example, women have this uh, infection more often than men, or, or that you know older individuals uh, tend to have a higher rate of, of death than, than younger, or what have you. Those can still constrain our assumptions for the model. So sensitivity analysis is a bit like calibration, but with calibration, we're homing in on a particular assumption for our parameters that best match empirical data. Whereas in sensitive analysis, we're interested in understanding how model behavior differs with those assumptions, but we're not judging it. We're not homing in on particular values. We're not coming up with some understanding about what plausible values are for those parameters. Um, calibration can inform, in some cases, sensitivity analysis. Um, so for example, following a calibration, um, maybe we do some sensitivity analysis around the point uh, where it, it found the best values to see you know, if, um, if, if it's uh, very, very sharply peaked in how good the match is or falls off and falls off quickly or whether you know, plausible values around there are pretty similar. Or maybe we, we do a sensitivity analysis to find if there's other points that yield just as good matches as, as those ones that were found in calibration. Um, that would be something. Or maybe there's certain parameters that we don't calibrate. We calibrate the ones that seem most sensitive, and then we test the sensitivity, given those, per, those calibrated values, of other parameters that we couldn't calibrate to make sure the model's not swung into you know, hu in huge ways by these other parameters. Um, we, we check our, our, our uh, robustness of our results or our vulnerability to being thrown off. Um, so the two can work together. That's calibration and sensitive analysis. Now, what does this all have to do with this lecture? Um, well, this lecture is also like calibration about bringing to bear um, empirical data. So these state spaces that we'll be talking about provide a third way of making use of empirical data from the world to constrain our understanding about the model. There's parameterization, there's calibration, and then indeed, there, is, there are state space methods using delay embedding, for example, which can allow you to, from features of the data you get from the world, and particularly from time series of data you get about the world, they whisper to you something about what the necessary model structure needs to be to account for the processes behind them. All data comes from data generating processes. It, there's some sort of process, be it memory lists or some dynamical system or what have you that gives rise to it. And that data will whisper to us about what process gave rise to it. And in a dynamical system, which is coupled where there's tangling of different features of the system. Whether it's an ecological context or a health, public health context or health care, um, social, social sphere, any number of these different areas where we have these tangled systems. What you hear from any one measurement, and this is an outlander statement, but I'm going to make it here to wet your appetite, because there will be some parts that command uh, that request your patience. The data that we get from the world on any one type of measure and any one thing we measure, ladies and gentlemen, maybe it's number of hospitalizations over time for COVID-19. Maybe it's the number of individuals who are who are diagnosed with Lyme disease over time. Um, maybe it's instead 
uh, the number of individuals who overdose from from uh, from uh, opioid related drugs uh, over time. One measure in from a, from a given system, the system may be very complex, involves hospitalizations, involves people getting diagnosed and testing, who even though they're oligosymptomatic, have almost no symptoms, uh, people who go through their entire time without developing symptoms, people who, who, who never go to hospital, even though they, uh, they have mild symptoms, et cetera. Even though it's a very complex articulated system, one measuring, ladies and gentlemen, one measuring whispers to us about the broader system when it's coupled. So what we see from gophers tells us something about the population of coyotes that, that hunt them. Coyotes are coyotes. I have viewers worldwide. Um, the number of people coming in for a hospitalization tells us something, it whispers to us something about the number of undiagnosed people out there, as well as something about the, the, the dynamics of susceptibles and how many are getting infected even though hospitalization occurs long after, long, long down the road from that, seven days, 10 days. Um, what we hear out of one measurement, if we listen closely enough, it actually encodes information about what's going on in all these different areas of the system that drive it. And that information is golden if we wanna to try to match the dynamics of that system at some level with a model's dynamics. Um, it, it whispers to us, for example, we may need an E state. Instead of having an SIR, we need a, a latent state, an exposed state, SEIR, for people who are infected but not yet infected. It, it says, I can't be matched without such a state. Um, and when we look at empirical data, it whispers, although it may be in an area of the system we can measure, it whispers to us about areas of the system we can't measure. And the denser the data, the higher the velocity of the data in this world of big data, the more reliable that whispering will be. And so that's what we're gonna take on today and uh, as time requires on Tuesday. Okay, so that's our quarry for today. And I hope that bit of a header, which wove in this understanding about sensitivity analysis and calibration uh, is useful as well to your understanding. And now this painful start to the, um, to the lecture will end and I will go on to the